So good morning to all of you who are joining us for our Facebook Live webinar. Uh, here to kind of celebrate this new book that's out called Yoga and Science in Pain Care by uh, Neil Pearson, Shelley Prosco, and Marlisa Sullivan. And I just have to say that I am so amazed at this book. Um, you know, I think all of us have been so grateful to Mother India and the people of India for bringing yoga to the world. And people like you are now taking the science and the research and the evidence-based medicine and you're, you're bridging the gap and kind of showing how it is that medicine and science and research are proving what the ancient sages taught us so, so long ago. So to me, this is so exciting and I'm sure all of us are interested. And, and also, I just wanna say that this, um, this broadcast is going to be um, in a virtual yoga summit in October with Singing Dragon because Singing Dragon is your publisher. And I, I want to commend Singing Dragon for taking a risk what I consider kind of risky to have such a pioneering spirit uh, about, you know, bridging this gap and, and bringing it together. So I'm, I'm so happy to have you, Marlisa and Shelley and Neil here today and to talk about your, your new book, Yoga and Science and Pain Care. And um, I think we'll just jump right in and, and ask you some questions. So um, I'm going to start with Shelley, if that's okay. Uh, Shelley, I, I read uh, your chapter in the book and I've been talking to you since um, last spring when we went to Montreal together. And one of the things that you taught me was this difference between using language of chronic pain versus persistent pain and why a lot of people in the field are starting to move towards persistent pain instead of chronic pain and that that language language actually matters. So could you comment on that and, and just enlighten us as to why that is so important? Yeah, I'm glad you started with that question, the language question. So we do talk about this in, in the book at the very beginning, in the introduction, and we talk about how important language is. And basically, when we look at the word chronic, it can have this tone of like devastation or sort of like a doomsday tone, like the pain won't ever get better, we can't change it, uh, there's nothing we can do about it. And there's this idea that the word persistent pain or persisting pain or pain that persists sounds a little bit more hopeful. And um, to many people in pain, they do you know, prefer that term. And in fact, as you know from, from what you've read and from what you've learned over the years, pain can change and there is hope. So that term um, is just, it just fits a little bit nicer with what we know from, from what the science is telling us and even just from our experience in working with people with pain. Um, but then it's, it's interesting too because everybody is different. And so some people actually prefer, some people in pain actually prefer the term chronic, um, like chronic pain because it might be more validating you know, and it tells them that, you know, I really do have a real problem, especially in light of, you know, times when maybe they're not believed, you know, by, by certain people. So that gives them some, something that is just more validating. Um, so, you know, the, the bottom line is we use the terms interchangeably in the book, but you're right, we, we do try to move more towards this idea of persistent pain with being aware that everybody's different has different preferences. Yeah, I can really see the importance of both because um, I recently had someone kind of say, oh, chronic pain is no big deal. I wake up every day with aches and pains to get over it, you know, get, get yourself pulled up and, and get to work. And, and a lot of people were very, very hurt by that comment because they said, you have no idea what we deal with on a daily basis. So they might prefer the term chronic pain, but someone else who really is like, I am ready to work every angle, my nutrition, my perception, my movement patterns, my, you know, all the things Neil's going to talk about in a few minutes in terms of all the things we do have control over and we can change in order to shift our experience of pain and actually shift our nervous system's experience of pain. 
they might prefer that more temporary term of persistent because it's not a, the end of the story, that it's just a, a, a state that I'm in at this point in my life that I'm working to hopefully move out of. So I really appreciate those two. And, and the idea that different people might prefer different ones. That's right. Great. Yeah. And I would add to um, not careful not to put, you know, people in boxes either so that, you know, that we have the idea that people who prefer chronic pain, that term chronic pain, uh, don't think there's hope or they, they're not willing to, you know, do some work and, and learn more. And so like, that's not the case either. It's just for whatever reasons, um, they just prefer the term chronic pain. Like I said, maybe it's more validating and they're yeah. also potentially really open to the fact that it, it might change and, and they just are open to learn more and to do what they can. I think a lot of people just don't know that, that there's hope and that they can change and that there are things that they can do because those aren't the messages that they're hearing. So that's why we wrote this book or one of the reasons is so that we can. Yeah. So Neil, did you have, it looks like you unmuted yourself there. Is that intentional? Do you have something to add? Well, there's, there's this, thanks, Ellie. There's this one, one other area where it becomes important because helping people with, with, with pain means that we need to talk to the policymakers. And so the policymakers of the world will have a very different reaction to us talking about persistent pain versus chronic pain. So, you know, as much as we, as Shelley's saying, it's so important that we find the right language for the individuals who are, who are sitting in front of us that we're trying to help. We need to recognize the problem isn't, uh, it's not just there, it's this bigger one. It's even like research grants. You're just not going to get the same funding for persistent pain and chronic. So we need to, you know, as I think you said, well, Amy, is that you don't throw a word out. You just use the word appropriately in the right situation. Thanks for saying that, Neil. I mean, we're going to talk at the end of the, the broadcast today about this thing called a white paper that you um, are, are writing to help government officials, policymakers, and yoga therapists and clients all understand that there is so much we can do about pain and that the message that we've all received that, you know, once you're in chronic pain or persistent pain, that's the end of the story. Oh, well, life is over that is so not the case and that yoga therapy can really shift people's perception, experience, and even how their nervous system and their brain functions with respect to pain. So again, this, this book that you've put out to me is revolutionary because it has the potential to change at all the different layers from the individual all the way to the government, uh, you know, regulators and people who are making these decisions. And I also want to throw in here, uh, you know, Neil, that you wrote a book called Understanding Pain and Live Well by Neil Pearson. Understanding Pain and Live Well by Neil Pearson. And to me, you know, it's a $6 book, an ebook on Amazon, but to me, it was written so beautifully and so simply that all of us can understand the basics of neuroscience and what's happening in the body. So I also wanted to say that because I think that was, that is an important offering in this, this picture too. So yeah. thank you for that. Oh, yeah. thanks, Amy. Appreciate it. So, Shelley, in, in the book that we're kind of uh, talking about today, Yoga and Science in Pain Care, uh, you wrote a chapter on compassion and com how important compassion is in pain care. So I, I have two questions. Why? Uh, uh, well, maybe I'll let, I'll, let, uh, I'll let Neil answer the first one, and I'll just stick with this one. So, Shelley... Tell us about the importance of compassion and pain care and why it's an important topic for you to include in this book. Thank you. It's a topic I'm so passionate about. So why it's important? Well, first of all, um, when we look at what some of the research is saying, it's still new. Um, we don't have a lot of it, but the research is starting to show that people in pain can actually benefit from two things, from receiving compassionate care, which doesn't sound too mind blowing. I mean, it sounds pretty common sense, um, but the literature is actually showing a lot of different benefits. And one thing I'll just say quickly, I'm obviously you know, not gonna go through everything in detail, but I really wanna highlight this one point um, in this one study that they did with uh, women that were living with persistent pain 
um, were in a, they were in this study for one whole year in this integrative rehab hospital, and they received uh, what, the, what the study described as compassionate care for that whole year. And there was a whole bunch of things that they described what entailed, what that included. And it was only until these women actually started receiving the compassionate care that they then could take the steps towards self-care and self-management, as we say a lot in, you know, in, the, in the pain world, um, you know, pain self-management. Or, so you know, as, as health providers and, and professionals, we're always asking the people we work with to, to take some action and, and how important self-care is. And it's really neat that we have some research showing that once people actually feel what it feels like to be cared for, and some of the words that the women used, they felt whole, complete, um, listened to, understood, valued, cared for, um, worthy, things like that. Um, you know, that only then can they make those changes. And I just, even just reading that, um, it just, it, yeah, doesn't it make your heart sort of, and yoga in and of itself is, is a compassionate practice. I mean, that's what it, that's part of what it is. And not only is it inherently a compassionate practice, but it also can help improve um, compassion or it can, you know, compassion can emerge from yoga practice. So that was just one small, you know, sort of tidbit um, that I found really fascinating, but people in pain can also benefit from self-compassion. So these are self-compassion practices, and I go into depth into that, into the book, uh, into the chapter, which I won't get into here, but that's really cool that we have a few studies that show these practices can help. And by the way, the practices that they show, they weren't um, described as yoga per se, but they're all components of yoga. Mm -hmm. So that's what I do in the chapter is I take these models that are out there and that have been researched and I parallel them to, to say, hey, you guys, look, this is what the research is saying, and and here's how yoga fits in. Um, so that's one. And then there's other orientations but the, uh, of compassion. But another one is um, compassion, uh, the benefit of us as the healthcare provider. Uh, providing compassionate care also has benefits to us as the healthcare provider, believe it or not. And that, and that can help reduce even things like burnout. And, you know, that's a huge topic as well. And I go into detail about that in the chapter. Um, and then, of course, self-compassion practiced by us, the, the healthcare provider and the, and the professional too, has a lot of different benefits. So I hope that gives, I hope that gives people listening an idea of, you know, of sort of what to, what to think about when you think of compassion in pain care. So it's a lot of different orientations of compassion and also a lot of different benefits. Yeah, I was just reviewing your chapter this morning and every single one of those things, we could spend an hour flushing that out because it's just fascinating. Um, and, you know, I think we as yoga therapists, which we all are, we know how important self-compassion is. We've read the work of Kristen Neff. We've, we've seen the models out there that you have compared in your chapter to the practices of yoga. And yet so many of us as yoga therapists even are having trouble with self-compassion and self-care. And I'll just give you a quick example. I just did a nine-day module uh, for my yoga therapy school. And the thing that people got most out of the module, even more than the curriculum and the education they received, they said, we received self-care for nine days. We slowed down. We came inward. We had compassion for each other as a sangha and also for ourselves. And people were just in tears at the end because even as yoga therapists, they hadn't had that experience very often until they came and did it for themselves for nine days. And I just thought that was beautiful. We all know it up here, but are we really doing it and practicing it and, and living it is the question. Right. And another thing to, to think about as well is our ability to provide compassionate care. Right. Dep there, you know, it depends on a whole variety of factors. So there are a number of fears, blocks, and resistances. That those are the terms they use in the literature. Fears, blocks, resistances um, for us humans <laughs> in to decide whether or not we provide, you know, compassionate care or a compassionate response. 
And so if our own system is not regulated, you know, if we're overwhelmed or if we're not practicing these these ideas of self-care and whatever that means, not having the insight and the awareness of our own suffering, um, you know, if we don't have that, then we're not regulated and then that's going to affect our ability to provide this optimal um, compassionate care. So like all of these layers all affect one another and it's just it's just so fascinating to me and I'm so glad that um, Marlisa and Neil allowed me to to include this as a chapter in the book because uh, I I was introduced you know to the science around compassion you know because it's a term now and Kristen Neff's work is just uh, you know the early 2000s when it really started and the research around self-compassion so it's really just new for me and I'm just learning about it and um and so to write this book chapter, I really took probably over a year to, to write this chapter, you know, and really look at the literature and um, it's just fascinating. So, And, so and I think it, it even mirrors what the ancient teachings are saying that if we ourselves as the healthcare provider or the yoga therapist are not in sattva, if our autonomic nervous system is not regulated, it's going to be very, very hard for us to teach someone else to do that because we actually haven't learned to do that. And number two, there is an energetic transmission that happens that when someone comes to you for yoga therapy, if I as the yoga therapist am at peace, I'm in sattva, I'm in a spacious light state of mind and body, they're going to have a completely different experience in my presence than if I'm frazzled and running late and papers are flying all over and uh, I'm angry or upset about something. So thank you for, for including all of that in, in the chapter. Uh, I think it's so, so important. And so many yoga therapists just say, yeah, 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 I know that. Tell me which breathing technique I should use. It's like, no, actually, that's 90% of the game. <laughs> and it may not even matter which breathing technique you choose <laughs> in the end, as long as it's a focused attention and breath, you know? Mm-hmm. Well, thank you, Shelley. I really appreciate your your efforts towards bringing this to the forefront. Great. Thank you. So I'm going to move to Neil. And Neil, as I was joking before our, um, our call here, I said, uh, Shelley's the nice, soft warm-up, and Marlisa's this nice, sweet, meaningful cool-down, but, but you're the, the pain biology guy. You're the guy who knows pain uh, science. You're the, the, the neurobiologist, and, and there are parts of your talks that I've seen and, and chapters in books that even as a PhD in psychology, I have trouble following because it is some deep deep stuff. And that's why I, I recommend it for beginners to go to the Understanding Pain and Live Well that you have on, on Amazon, because I just think it's so beautifully broken down for the beginner. Mm-hmm. So one of the things that you are known for that I agree with you on, and I think is very interesting, is that what shows up on the MRI or the x-ray, you know, that that what we see in empirical terms and the doctor says, oh, you have terrible necrosis of the hip or a torn, you know, whatever, um, this is going to be terrible, that that actually doesn't always translate to how much pain someone has. Mm -hmm. It doesn't translate to their experience. And that there are people with a terrible MRI that don't have pain. And there are people with a wonderful x-ray or MRI that have terrible, terrible pain. So can you talk to us a little bit about that? Well, it's a great, uh, it's a massive topic. I was trying to bring my mind to how we start. So maybe I can start by talking about a, a patient that I saw a couple of years ago. She was in her 80s, um, just referred from a doctor into me as a physical therapist because the doctor knew you know, that I work with people with pain. And um, so the, the, uh, I knew she was in her 80s, and I knew her name, and that's all I knew before she walked in the door. And of course, she comes in, I introduce myself, and I'm about to start into asking her some questions, like, you know, what brings you here? And the first thing she says is start to reach into her purse and says, I think you need to see this, you know, this report before we talk. And, and my reaction is always, well, I'd actually like to hear your experience before I look at a report. Um, and she said, no, 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 you really need to look at this. And so I pull this thing out and it's actually five pages or she pulls it out. It's five pages. They're all folded up. And I can see that each page has got lots of things underlined and circled and highlighted and all this stuff. And so 
what had happened was she had ended up with this back pain and she went to see her doctor and, and I'm not exactly sure why, but she was, maybe it was just because of her age, uh, but she was sent in to get an x-ray. And so I'm guessing the radiologist was having a boring afternoon because he actually wrote a page on each level of her lumbar spine. There was a page on L12 and a page on L23, which she's 85. There's going to be lots of stuff on there, right? So of course, the more I read through this, the more I'm, I'm worried and just, one of the most amazing things, she actually had a degenerative spondylolisthesis of L3 on L4 at grade two, right? Which, you know, would really excite most people to, and that was really circled a lot. Anyway, so at the end of it, I said to her, so um, you, you've looked at this, right? And she says, well, yeah, um, you know, I've circled it and my daughter's a doctor and I asked my daughter some things about it. And I said, well, what do you think this means? And she was really great. She says, well, it means I've got an 85 year old spine. And I'm like, well, well, why do you think your back's sore? Well, my back's sore because it's the spring and I hadn't gardened since last fall. And I went out and I tried to do three or four hours of gardening and now my back's sore. And so, so the, the really fascinating thing about this, this individual was she was, attributing, she was attributing the increase in pain to an activity, whereas most of the time we've been, um, we've been sort of led to believe that pain is because the tissue is damaged. And if the tissue is damaged, there will be pain. And if the tissue is more damaged, there'll be more pain. And if you have a injury and the pain doesn't go away, it's because the tissue damage didn't go away, which, which there's some logic to this. Um, and we could say that, that, you know, maybe some of it's right, but it's not a complete view because how much pain we have depends on actually everything. Um, so the you know you've got these danger messages going from your body up through your spinal cord up to your brain and, and but your brain's not just getting danger messages all by itself it's getting messages about everything right it's even getting messages from itself right so what the brain needs to do is come up with a sensible story of what's uh, what's going on um, and we've been led to believe that the purpose of pain is to tell us exactly where the problem is what the problem is how bad it is but that's actually not the purpose of pain. The, you know, what the brain does is interprets all this information and decides whether we need to be protected somehow. And so it comes around to this idea that, that it's, it's hard to really, really grasp this because so many times in our life, the pain that we felt has been pretty accurate. You know, most people, most of us, have had more injuries to our skin than any other part of our, our physical body. And when you have injuries to your skin, because the sensory apparatus there is so sophisticated that you could, like if I put my arm back here, you could stick me with a pin, burn me with something, pinch me with something, um, you know, and, or cut me with a knife. And I'd be able to tell you the difference between those because what it felt like would be what you were doing because you have this great sensory apparatus in your skin. But below your skin, you actually don't have that kind of sensory apparatus you mostly have sensors that look at pressure and chemical irritation, uh, but nothing that can tell you like that exquisite information. Like if you could take the skin off my body without numbing my arm <clears throat> or, or giving me lots of pain while you did that, and you stuck me with a pin, burned me, cut me with a knife, pinched me, I would say, ouch, with each thumb. But I actually couldn't tell you what it was. Mm -hmm. And I had a hard time telling you where it is because the apparatus isn't so accurate. I'm sorry. That's just a, me doing a real quick, you know, example of how this thing isn't quite so accurate as we think. But a lot of times when we haven't really thought about this, it takes a lot of learning more parts of pain biology and pain physiology to understand how these two things don't really match up. But we could go to a more simple thing like a paper cut, right? So when you have a paper cut, there's not much damage to your body, but you certainly can have a ton of pain from it. Mm -hmm. right? So we've actually all had experiences like this. But in the moment when I have pain, it is absolutely really hard to think about the idea that the amount of pain that I have right now is not an accurate indication of what's happening in my body. Or when I look at that x-ray and see that my joint's quite worn out, it's really, really hard to believe that that shouldn't be really painful, right? And we even say things like that. You know, you watch a movie, you see somebody fall off something, well, that's going to leave a mark or that's going to be sore in the morning. And this sort of idea is that if the body's injured that much, there's going to be this much injury. And it's not as simple and it sort of leads us to the, you know, why is that important? If we believe that pain is an accurate indication of what's happening in our body, when we move during asana and there is pain, we are going to stop doing that movement for fear of injury, Right. Right, right. And, 
And we need to understand that it's not that we don't listen to that alarm, but we need to listen to the alarm in the right way to recognize it's not fully accurate. You know, you could, I think I've heard people say sometimes, they, they, they've heard a yoga teacher say, you know, as long as you can breathe calmly, you know you're safe. And say, well, that's not really true. If your breath is getting really tight, maybe you need to start to wonder, maybe it's not so safe anymore. But there's actually no one alarm system that we have that can accurately tell us how much to push in an asana or how far to go. And so a big, big part of yoga comes in handy is that we teach people to be more aware. And we teach people to, to be discerning and we teach people to pay attention to multiple things. And, and we've sort of come up with this idea of, well, during asana, if pain's not accurate, you don't throw pain away. You don't ignore it because it's still an alarm. Even if it's not 100% accurate, you don't ignore it. But what you do is you learn how to pay attention to multiple alarms at the same time. So if you could pay attention to the pain and, and your breath and your body tension and what's happening in your mind, or maybe your sense of energy, Right? We need to start to divide our attention to pay attention to numerous alarms before we can get more discerning to know, yeah, I think this is an okay thing. This is safe. I think I'll be okay. Um, yeah, so I'd like to, to tell you a little story about what I did after reading uh, some of your writings. Okay. I just It was an experiment I did in the last few days. And you know some of the things you write about are that things like your allostatic load, although I'm not sure you use that word, um, the dysregulation of your autonomic nervous system, the emotions you're feeling, like all these things come together to give you your perception in any given moment, even thoughts contribute to the perception or non-perception of, of pain. And so what you wrote in your book is that sometimes when the nervous system is a little bit dysregulated, it just, any, any signal that's coming up or down, it's like, oh, that's pain. We don't like that. And it just kind of goes into these over alarms or over sensitivity. And one of the things you wrote was to talk to yourself and say, is this serious? Is, is this actually a danger? should this be causing this kind of pain in my body and just having a conversation with yourself about the reality. So I slept on my neck wrong two nights ago. And for two days I've been like, Oh, my neck, my neck. And of course, you know, I'm spinning into, did I, do I have a bulging disc? And if that's the case, how am I going to handle the airplane on the way to Korea? Like I just, I took it over the edge. Right. So I read your, uh, your chapter again this morning and I thought, okay, I'm going to try. I'm going to see if I just have a conversation and say, is sleeping wrong on your neck really that big of a danger? Is this really as big of a deal as you're making it out to be? Could your nervous system just be overreacting because you're stressed out? And I'm not kidding you. I think within 15 minutes of having that conversation, I don't have any neck pain. Now, is that what you're trying to tell us? I mean, I'm not saying it's going to work every single time, but it's almost like I soothed myself from believing what my brain and nervous system were trying to tell me was a huge danger. And it really wasn't. So I really like that story. And, and one of the things I would say to listeners is we need to take care that the message that's heard is not that you can just think your way out of pain. Right. Because that's not what you intend. That's not what we intend. What the scientists would tell us is that uh, we have more pain when there's more evidence of danger and we have less pain when there's more evidence of safety or more credible evidence of safety. And so uh, you've got that pain that, you know, obviously there's signals going through your body up towards your brain, your brain's interpreting that this is dangerous. And then, as you said, uh, some of the catastrophic thinking started to happen, all this sort of stuff that, that happens. That, that's a normal thing. We all do this. And then often, thank God. <laughs> yeah, then often we beat ourselves up and the beating ourselves up about having catastrophic thinking as if it's abnormal, it just leads into the whole thing. But anyway, so what we're talking about is that uh, with the practice of yoga, that you can change the credible evidence of safety and danger through multiple, multiple ways. So what you did was more of a cognitive approach, but you could do it through movement. You could do, through, do it through body tension. You could do it through your breath. You could do it through um, uh, emotional impact. You could do it through ritual, the ritual of rolling out your mat and taking care of yourself. You could do it as, as Shelley's talked about, about compassion. I mean, Marlisa talks about this a ton in, in her work as well, right? There's so many ways that we can change this. 
And if our view is that pain and tissue damage are related and the only thing that has to do with pain is tissue, then we have a hard time recognizing that pretty much everything that we can do in yoga has an opportunity to change the evidence of safety and danger and then actually improve things. And just the one other thing I want to add on that is you know, you're talking about uh, compassion, being compassionate for someone. I actually stumbled last year on some research about autonomic synchrony and that when we are in the presence of someone that we have uh, positive feelings for, that there will actually, we actually start to sync up. So they're talking about brain waves, heart rate variability, breathing, skin conductance, all this autonomic nervous system stuff is actually syncing up. They're not telling us who syncs up with who syncs up with whom, right? If you have an anxious right. person and not, you know, sattvic and not, um, we don't know yet how that's driven, but it's it's sort of the the science to show what you were talking about, which is so cool. Could, could you give me a copy of that? I think that is one of the most important things that I try to teach yoga therapists in my, my school is, yes, I want you to know about Ayurveda. I want you to know about pain science. I want you to know about the gunas. I want you to, yes, but if you don't have your system, and if I don't have my system, which I have to constantly work on, in order, and my lifestyle in order, and my, my autonomic nervous system balanced, the healing probably isn't going to happen with the client. So. Absolutely. Well, I think that that, you know, the, the other chapter that, are, that I wrote is about education. And right. it's, um, what in part, what we're saying is that our education of self as a yoga therapist, as a practitioner um, is part of the way that it, it, it becomes, an, it, we become an educational agent for the person in front of us. Right. So that the person can witness how we actually can affect things um, and that it becomes so important in terms of co-regulation because if you can't see someone else doing it, it's really hard for you to even imagine that would ever work for you. And I know you've had this experience like I have, Neil, that when a pain client first comes to us, the things we suggest to them seem so outrageous. Like, say no to my kids. How could I possibly do that? That would be the end of the world. And then, you know, six months later, they're like, of course, I'm saying no to my kids. I had to, to get out. You know, it's just their perception just needs, we need to model it for them. We need to educate them what's possible. And, and as you say in, in the book chapter, is that the education in and of itself is an intervention. Could you just say maybe two minutes about that? Yeah. So, Briefly, there's a number. Uh, there's a lot of research, mostly done by a physiotherapy researcher in, in Adelaide, Australia, Lorimer Mosley. But mm. they've done lots of research showing that when we teach people about pain physiology, so actually how nerves work, how they, how neurotransmitters work, how you know all that stuff works inside the body, when people understand pain uh, neurophysiology, um, that they they you get a different perspective of it. It's actually a very similar perspective to what we understand in yoga. But anyway, we can teach people about pain to help them reconceptualize it so that they, it's, that threat value goes down and they see a new way to try to recover. But so we can teach people cognitively, right? Get you to sit down and listen and learn or read a book. But there's a lot of us that learn best through doing rather than from reading and writing. So all of us here, the, the four of us, we've been trained to learn as someone talks to us or we read books. But there are a lot of people that we work with who, that, that they haven't had that same kind of training. Their training has been learning by doing. And so the practices of yoga allow us to have, if I can call it embodied or physical experiences that things can change. Part of the point about education is to teach people that pain isn't immutable, that there are things that we as individuals can do to influence it, that it is changeable. And so we can give that as Lorimer has been teaching people uh, primarily through a cognitive thing. Like he doesn't just do cognitive, but that's where he starts. But yoga therapy, the physical practices of yoga through breathing and regulation and discernment and movement, a lot of times we can, we can actually see, we experience the change in self. And so to me, what, and actually I just finished a six day uh, workshop on pain care yoga with, with people in pain and practitioners. And what's really, really fascinating is we do both in it. And I think really you get the knowledge and then you sort of think, well, that makes sense, but I wonder if it's really true. But then you do it with your body, and then you, that sort of confirms for you, oh, okay, it's, it's relevant and it's true. Or you can go the other way. You can learn it through the physical practice. And then sometimes 
we start to wonder, well, is it really real, even though it's just in our body? But then somebody comes along and says, well, here's some science, here's some physiology that says, yeah, this is actually happening when you do that. And we go, oh, okay, I guess it's more real. We're sort of odd that way, like pain's odd that way. You know, we ha- I had a training recently too, and the exact same thing happened. Like we learned about it for a few days and we had live clients come in and the, the experience of the clients almost seemed like magic like severe, severe things. And they're calling back day two later saying, I don't have any pain. What the heck just happened to me? And I think everybody in the training was kind of like, is this for real? This, this seems too good to be true. How can that be? And then when you show them the science, they're like, oh yeah, okay, I guess it's real. Let's do this. So it's funny that even us, we have trouble believing how powerful these tools are. <laughs> I know I do. It's always shocking to me. I, I almost feel in awe of it. So, Well, I think what we see in those situations too is the, the power of social engagement. Mm-hmm. Um, that uh, you, know, you can actually, I really believe, and I've got no research for this, but I really believe that you can, uh, people can feel greater changes when they do it in this caring, compassionate group. Um, than yes. they often can on their own. And, and you know, there could be the other way around is that there are some individuals that within a group, they just they can't let go quite the same way and that they'll, they'll learn it best in a one-on-one scenario. But once we do sort of let go and we can be okay in a group, that the power there is extraordinary. And I think that's one of the reasons why well, we would all agree, one of the reasons why the practices of yoga uh, are different from what we do in physical therapy or in, in, in psychotherapy. I love that. Thank you, Neil, for breaking it down into, uh, into a way that we can all understand. And so this brings us to Marlisa. And, you know, what you were just talking about, Neil, is, is this idea of human connection and how important it is in helping people to uh, experience their persistent or chronic pain in a way that they can handle. So Marlisa, you are all over. Everywhere I look, every podcast, every book, every, you're just bursting right now with this enthusiasm and knowledge around um, how it is that spirituality fits into pain science, and specifically uh, eudaimonia. Uh, eudaimonia being a, a, a term cultivated by Aristotle, meaning finding meaning and connection and purpose in life. And, and so you have really laid out in some of your papers and in the, the, the book that we're promoting today, that when people find connection and meaning and purpose, and they no longer feel isolated, and they have a reason to get up in the morning, that their physiology actually changes. So can you just make that link for us first? Like what types of physiological changes when people experience eudaimonia in their lives. Yeah, and um, just to like take it a little step back into what you were talking about with spirituality, one of the reasons I really appreciate and get excited about the research in eudaimonia is because it really mirrors what uh, the components of spirituality. So in research, spirituality is differentiated from religion Um, in that it's about a connectedness extending from the person to quality social relationships to something more existential. Meaning and purpose is often part of spiritual paths, as well as um, values such as like non-harming, forgiveness, and those kinds of things. Um, And then um, eudaimonic well-being, which comes from Aristotle's eudaimonic happiness, the research has broken it down into very similar constructs where it's about greater personal connectedness through things like your ability to be authentically you, your personal expressiveness, your self-actualization, meaning and purpose is a big component of it, quality social relationships. And um, Aristotle actually talked about the virtue ethics, things like humility, generosity, being really foundational to uh, eudaimonia. So that again, the values come into play here. Which, can I just interrupt for a moment? I mean, that's that connection uh, of those virtues is basically yogas, yamas, and niyamas, Yeah. right? So. Yeah, and so, and so I make a lot of parallels between even that and yamas and niyamas and dharma, like this idea that uh, in the Mahabharata, it talks about the yamas and niyamas being doorways to, to dharma. Um, mm-hmm. And so, so the research in eudaimonic well-being, well, I'll start with the research in social isolation. There's research in social isolation 
shows that when we perceive ourselves as isolated, meaning that um, I experience isolation, you could be around hundreds of people and be married and have children and perceive yourself as isolated. You could be around no one in the world and feel connected to the universe around you. So it's really about your perception of isolation, that it actually has um, negative health outcomes, both for mental health and physical health. And in the physical health outcomes, Stephen Cole has this work on how it's called social genomics and how when we perceive ourselves as isolated, that it changes, the, it activates the CTRA gene expression profile that upregulates inflammation and downregulates the immune system. So we have increased inflammation, suppression of our immune system in a way that people see in neurodegenerative diseases, uh, cancers, cardiovascular diseases. And eudaimonic well-being, Stephen Cole has found that eudaimonic well-being actually um, downregulates that expression. And one of the really cool things about his research is that they've shown, I don't, I don't know if this was his or someone else's, but they showed that hedonic happiness, like the, just like that transitory feeling of happiness, like if you like a sunny day or whatever, um, that, that that happiness actually doesn't have that effect on that gene. Wow. So it's only that um, eudaimonic well-being, particularly meaning and purpose, that has been shown to uh, change our gene expression profile to help support our inflammatory and immune systems, which can support our health and well-being in any kind of neurodegenerative cancers, cardiovascular diseases. Even um, autoimmune. I mean, that's yeah, huge. Yeah, autoimmune, yeah. And then there's others, too, like that eudaimonic well-being is associated with less pain intensity, um, uh, greater functioning, even if you have a chronic pain condition, uh, less helplessness, less disability. So, I mean, the research is already there showing how finding meaning and purpose in life downregulates and, and changes our inflammation. That is already hard science that's been done. We don't even have to do that. That's what's exciting to me is, oh my God, they did the hard part. What we have to do as yoga therapists is show how yoga therapy can cultivate helping the client to find their meaning and purpose. Because if we provide that link that yoga therapy can do this, the rest of the science is already done. So how, how are we going to do that, Marlisa? Well, there is one paper. Um, it's a small study that did show that yoga improved eudaimonic well-being. So there is that one paper. Um, we, uh, um, some friends, colleagues and I wrote an explanatory model of yoga therapy basing it on its philosophical perspectives. Um, and so part of my real passion is to continue to show that the practices of yoga um, have greater power for things like eudaimonic well-being when they're done in relationship to that larger philosophical or s spiritual context. Um, and so eudaimonic well-being offers a kind of secular spirituality where you could talk to anyone about meaning and purpose and what brings them a sense of connection to themselves and all those kinds of things. Um, so I think if we can, you know, instead of asking the question, like, which of these asana um, are going to help this thing? Instead, it's like, it's not just the asana, it's the asana, pranayama, meditation, yamas and niyamas, anything else you're doing within this context of supporting meaning and purpose. So even like what y'all were just talking about with the um, education piece, um, in the research, they talk about this idea of top-down and bottom-up regulation, where we can use our mind to affect our physiological state, we can use our body to affect our mental, emotional state. Um, so if, if instead of using asana for musculoskeletal imbalance, meditation for anxiety, we're using all the practices together to support an experience of the individual towards uh, their meaning, their purpose, their sense of personal connectedness, which then affects their relationships with others. Yeah, and we just had a paper come out in Yoga Therapy Today magazine um, on salutogenesis, and, and basically that, that yoga therapy is not yogopathy. Mm -hmm. It's not that we're going in there to fix your knee. That's Somebody else gets to do that. Not to say that your knee won't get fixed, because oftentimes it does in this whole process, but by, by making it all the tools of yoga that you just reminded us of the eight limbs and the personal connection with the therapist and the going inward and starting to connect deeply with your own self and finding meaning and purpose and then possibly connecting with something larger than yourself. It's that whole picture that is going to, you know, 
create less inflammation, have a positive effect on your immune system, and actually change your life. And, and your knee may not hurt anymore after that. Yeah, and that's one of the things I appreciated about Ananda, who wrote the paper with us, saying that doing yoga, he says that doing yoga as yoga apathy isn't necessarily a negative thing. It's great to use a posture to help with this or a meditation to help with that. However, that's not the depth of what yoga therapy can do. And so when we're using them under, instead of trying to take the practices and put them in the symptom management model, we can instead take the practices and consider how do we, um, how do we help this person experience salutogenesis or eudaimonic well-being or a sense of meaning and purpose. So, so just give me a few minutes on what it is that brought you to this idea of of bringing yoga therapy, yoga, spirituality, and science together. Like this is, this is your, your area that you just love. Can you tell us just a little bit about what drew you to that and, and why it's so meaningful to you? Well, I think um, part of it is that I started school in medical anthropology. So I've been interested in the idea of how our spirituality and our beliefs impact our health and healing for, I don't know, as long as I can remember. Um, but then I, um, I've practiced in areas where people had a different religion than I had. And mm -hmm. so I wanted to be able to speak to religious ideas in a way that wasn't specific to my religious ideas or spiritual ideas. Um, and then they didn't have to necessarily adopt um, um, Sanskrit words or anything like that, that they could really find a way to um, experience these things in a way that was in alignment with themselves, like their own values. Um, so then, you know, so as I would practice integrating yoga into physical therapy, I came upon many religious people who really wanted to learn it, but they would speak of their fears about going into these kinds of philosophies and what it might mean for them. So to, um, to me, it was really important to develop many different languages and a way of supporting inquiry into something that could be triggering for someone but how to make it something that was really accessible, that this is really something we're all thinking about and wondering about and going through life around. And so how is it that I connect with that person in that moment and open up a dialogue through which they're going to be able to express it? And so for me, that path has been yoga um, and the language of neurophysiology helps me to, like eudaimonic well-being and polyvagal theory, allow me to have different kind of to Neil's point earlier, it allows, it allows me to have specific principles that someone can wrap their mind around so they can put their cognition at ease and have an experience that changes how they, how, whatever they're feeling. Yeah. And I want to point out that this is not cultural appropriation because the gratitude and thanks is given to yoga from India. I mean, it, it's not that it's that we have to use different languages to connect with different people around the world with different belief systems. So I just want to point that out because it's, it's important that it's not that we're stripping yoga of its cultural significance and saying, we're going to, you know, call it this over here, give it a different name, new package. The, the, the gratitude is given where it came from. And sometimes we need to speak different languages to reach different people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it's one of the things I think is just so amazing is that through these different wisdom traditions from Aristotle, from India, that there are these concepts that are shared. And um, I've, I've read um, some different books where which really talked about the shared communication between these places in the world years and years, and, you know, throughout time. Yeah, thank you. Well, there's a few other things that I want to get to, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on. And one of them is, uh, Shelley, this might go back to you, and I'm not sure who else is a co-author. I think Matt Taylor might be, maybe Neil and Marlisa are also. Um, this idea of a white paper. So first of all, can you tell us what a white paper is? Because you're writing a white paper on the topic of pain and how it is that yoga therapy can help people with chronic and persistent pain. Sure, yeah. So I'm going to be very transparent um, because I like that. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I actually didn't know what a white paper was uh, before I wrote it. Um, so I had to learn a lot and um, it was an amazing process. So uh, Matt Taylor um, it was, was the person that kind of got us all together and yes, myself and Marlisa and Neil. 
So it was the four of us that wrote this paper. And basically a white paper is, it's, it's like a um, authoritative, that's what they say when you look it up on Wikipedia, but it, it's a paper, a document that really tries to get like all the subject matter experts together about a certain topic. And it's usually a topic, uh, you know, surrounding a complex issue. And so it gets all of us together talking about this um, complex issue and outlining the problems, um, the barriers, and then of course, the, the subject matter that we're talking about is pain and yoga therapy and, and offering some solutions to this complex issue. And so what we've done, um, and, and then also to make recommendations, of course, so the solutions are there and that includes very specific call to actions or recommendations. And that could be to clinicians, to the, uh, the general public, to policymakers, uh, researchers, insurers, etc. cetera. Um, so what uh, this, there's a little bit of a history behind this paper <clears throat> and there's some acronyms here that I had to write down because I always get them mixed up. Um, but basically, there's in the U.S., they have this, um, or you all have, because Neil and I are Canadian. Um, so we've got two Canadians and two Americans on this uh, white paper. Um, so the U.S. has this national strategy for comprehensive integrative pain management. And this um, acronym CIPM or CIPM uh, is really something that uh, the it's a pain care, they developed it at the Integrative Pain Care Policy Congress. They've had a few of those already. And Matt Taylor was uh, representing the International Association of Yoga Therapists at this Congress, which was really cool because that gives, you know, yoga therapy basically a voice at this, at this Congress that is just huge. There's, I think he had said, you know, over... 60 or 70 different organizations and 100 different leaders and um, people. And can I interrupt? I mean, these mm -hmm. are big organizations like the Veterans Administration, the Department of Defense, Medicare, Medicaid. I mean, when you say 60 to 70 organizations in this Congress, Congress of Integrative Pain Management, you're talking the big players. So the fact that IAYT through Matt Taylor even has a seat at that table is actually pretty incredible. Right. Yeah. And um, so what was next sort of in line. I mean, and a bunch of different, you know, recommendations or ideas came from, from that. And, but one thing that was needed from that was a white paper to be written. So this, this paper that, like I said, it, it involves people that have this knowledge and in a way that we can translate this knowledge and make these recommendations. So, so basically the paper that we wrote is, is about the issue of and um, I'm not going to say opioid crisis, but that is what often people are relating to. But really what we want to try to get, you know, clear about is that it's more of a pain crisis and it's more of a, of a public health crisis. So we, we go through that in the paper, but really we outline this issue, this problem of a pain problem, a pain crisis, and we outline different uh, issues, problems, we outline barriers, and then we outline yoga therapy and what that is, and then how yoga therapy can offer some solutions or how yoga therapy can be part of this team. So remember, it's not that yoga therapy is this panacea. We're not talking about yoga therapy as the only option, but as a team for this larger, um, you know, this comprehensive integrative pain management. Um, and then we make some recommendations at the end, and um, I don't know, Neil and Marlisa. I, I, I think it. I just want to say, Shelley. I think it's a really big deal. I mean, we're not the only solution, but we have great solutions, as your the book that the three of you wrote shows. I mean, and and I think a lot of people at the higher levels of policymaking are out of ideas. They don't know what to do. So the fact that you guys have written this book and this white paper to help them understand how yoga therapy could actually impact people's experience of pain is huge to me. I'm just in total gratitude for the three of you to taking the time to do this. Cause what a lot of people don't understand is that, as you said, Shelly, you took a year to write this chapter and a year to do that. That's for free. You guys are volunteering your time to help humanity understand how you, how it is that yoga therapy and yoga can 
can actually help people who are suffering. So, and, and we have to educate from the policy level all the way down through the practitioner down to the individual who experiences pain. I mean, any, any of us could read that white paper and really start to understand, you know, how it is we can, can give our pain more care. So yeah. Neil, or, or go ahead, Shelley. I was going to ask Neil if he no. had anything he wanted okay. to add. Yeah, no, I was just going to add that. And, and part of this process, it's really important that we bring in the research because it's not going to get to those levels. So it's that bridging again. So we took a lot of time in this white paper to very carefully, you know, sift through the research and, and discuss that. So Neil, do you have anything you want to add? Uh, you know, the only thing I'd uh, add is that, um, well, two bits. One is that there is a national uh, pain strategy uh, task force in Canada right now that's just mm -hmm. started for our, our national governments put that together and it, we're happy to hear that they're interested in, in reading the, this white paper as part of what they're doing um, and uh, we've also heard that in U the UK that there's some some interest there uh, for their parliament to read this so it, it's something that doesn't exist sort of like the textbook and you know each of these things are uh, you know filling a gap because there's so many gaps as we all know in terms of helping people with pain and finding the right pain care and pain policy and pain education. And, you know, we, we, we get excited with each one of these things is, you know, will, will this be the tipping point? Right. You know, cause, cause you know, there's some point when we got to get to that spot, but you know, a lot of times, you know, we, we've built so many things before now and it seems like we actually might be getting there um, to, to I agree. things are, things are going to really start to change. People are really start going to start to listen and, and of course, that puts us in the other big place of we need to build capacity. We need, you know, we need to get increased capacity within the, the therapy side and the, the frontline individuals to be able to move forward. And hopefully this textbook will help help with that in a whole bunch. I agree, Neil. I mean, I, I consider myself well educated in the field of yoga therapy and even pain management from the Ayurvedic perspective, but I'm just learning like all of us out there, the research that is there, how you guys have outlined it, how you've taken other models and connected it to show how yoga therapy can do something similar. I just think every single yoga therapist needs to read your book because this is, this is where yoga therapy is actually going to make a difference on a national or international scale. I think this idea of pain care is is where we can actually shine and, and show what it is that we can do that's different from a lot of other fields. Mm -hmm. So Marlisa, what, what would you like to add to this part of the conversation? Um, well, so one of the, uh, what came to me when you were just talking is like one of the things that I really love about our book is we have all of these amazing authors that contributed different chapters mm. on, in their expertise and they all offer like another portal into the same material or the same, the same um, I, uh, idea of helping with pain. And so in, this, in that same kind of vein of idea of um, language, like we can be more successful with our clients, the more ways we have of connecting with them and helping them to understand and developing a language with them. We'll have that same success if we develop that repertoire of language to talk to other healthcare professionals, to policymakers, to whoever it is that needs to hear. So for example, like this white paper is written in a way so that people that are making policy, um, payers, things like that, institutions like hospitals that might want to bring yoga in, they can begin to demonstrate how and why that is. Um, so the more languages, the more portals we have, the more accessible. Um, some, so, you know, in, um, I really appreciate in the yoga community how this idea of accessibility has become so strong. It's becoming such an important thing that people are beginning to see. And it, in, to further the accessibility from the physical route, which is really wonderful, but also the accessibility of the philosophy and the science and the mental and emotional pieces. And so the hope is that each of these authors and each of the chapters offers another portal and a way of understanding that the white paper does so that we can really begin to educate yoga therapists, yoga teachers, as well as like policymakers and people just living in the world of the powerful impact we can have. Can I, I agree with that. I mean, all these chapters are in the book are so different and unique. And a few months ago, when you guys let me read a kind of a pre, uh, pre copy, I opened the book and chapter number one was called the lived experience of pain by Joletta Belton. 
I cried as I read it because it was so much my experience. It was exactly how I felt. And I realized, oh my God, there's another person out there that has this experience and she's overcome it and she's understood how to work with it. And it gave me hope. And so I think not only yoga therapists, but I want to give specifically that chapter to my clients who, who are experiencing pain to let them know, look, there are things we can do. I know you haven't been educated in these methods yet, but, but let's give it a try together and to give people hope. Right. So I, I just, all those levels from policymakers to medical doctors, to psychologists, to yoga therapists, to physical therapists, occupational therapists, and the clients, I think the work and the book that you've put out here could impact every single one of those levels. So I'm just thrilled if, if you can't tell. I know I'm like gushing over the three of you. <laughs> um, so we are about out of time, but I just wanted to mention one more thing that's going to happen that I think our listeners might be interested in. And that is that there's going to be a pain symposium in London on November 13th, 2019. And it's going to be in person and online, we hope. We have to talk to Heather Mason and see if we can get the online piece figured out. But I'm encouraging that because I want it to go worldwide so more people can benefit. Uh, Heather Mason and the Minded Institute are putting on this symposium in London um, on November 13th so that all of us can learn more about pain care and, and helping our clients to suffer less. So we'll have more information about that coming out soon. We're just in the early planning stages, but I know all three of you are going to be part of this symposium and I look forward to hearing from each one of you. And you're also Even, part of it, Amy, right? I am. I, I have no idea what I'm going to say. I, I, I'm still thinking like, okay, I, I guess I'll take the clinical approach because I've had so many years of just working with people. And even though, as Neil said, I, I didn't have all the science in my head behind it, it actually worked. And I knew it worked. So now I'm just happy to be able to draw the research in that all of you have so beautifully laid out about why is what I'm doing working? Oh my God. <laughs> it's, a, it's a real validator for those of us who've been working out in the field, but didn't really concretely understand why it worked. And, and I think your book is telling us the why. And, and really helping all of us. So any last words of wisdom before we close for the day? I'd like to add just one thing and that, and I think Joletta did it really, really well in her chapter is that we recognize that within the yoga therapy that we can help people towards the potential outcomes. That, you know, when we have pain, what we want is less pain and be able to move with more ease and to get back to life again. And um, it's one thing that we need to understand in, in yoga therapy and as clinicians is that some of the people we work with are going to be able to say, hey, you know, my pain's mostly gone and I'm back to everything I was doing before. Uh, yet there will be some people who will say, you know, it's, it's better, but it's not all gone and you have helped me. And then there's going to be this other group that we really don't fully understand is the people who say, you know, the pain really hasn't changed much, but you helped me get my life back. And, and yoga, one of the beautiful things is it, it yoga encompasses that. And that's not part of the medical pain care sort of idea. Um, and, and like I say, I think Joletta talks about that. She doesn't say it exactly like that, but it's there in her chapter, chapter loud and clear is that, you know, we, we can find ways to live well and have pain at the same time. I think that is a wonderful place to end, Neil. Thank you. And thank you, Shelly and Marlisa. It's been such a pleasure to, to not only do this webinar, but to prepare for doing this webinar in educating myself and hopefully all of you out there in Facebook land and whoever listens to this in the future will learn something and buy this book and, and really start to kind of get your chops up on pain care. So thank you all. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. I think um, I'd want to do say thank you to all our contributing authors. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we haven't really mentioned them other than Joletta. Um, do you mind if I just say their names? Sure, I would love quick. to. You yeah. sort, of, sort of already closed, but I thought, yeah. Know. So Joletta <laughs> Belton um, and St <clears throat> Stephanie Munez, Matthew Taylor, Matt Erb, Lori Rubenstein Fazio, Michael Lee, Tracy Sondick, Antonio Sousis, and then um, Singing Dragon as our publisher, and uh, the three of us 
of course, contributing a few chapters. So thank, thank you to all of you if you're listening for contributing because the book wouldn't have happened without um, all of them. Yes, thank you. Okay, that's a wrap. And thank you for participating. And we hope to have you join us at the Minded Institute uh, Pain Symposium in November. And you can see more from Marlisa, Neil, and Shelley. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.